In the spirit of transparency, my dear viewers, today's subject was originally going to be the Los Alamos criticality accident, where a worker was blasted with enough radiation to unalive him in 35 hours, and his organs were taken for a joyride across the United States for the grander purpose of science. But then it occurred to me that it's just a more modern example of a phenomenon that's continued for thousands of years, all across the globe. In fact, while most people in the first world have little to worry about, some corners of the globe still sustain quite sizable body markets. Strap in, viewer, because today we'll be exploring the dark and morbid history of... Body Snatching. <laughs> The history of body snatchers begins in the 13th century with the University of Bologna. Um, Bologna? Yeah, whatever. The first recorded human dissections were performed around 1300, and it only took them 19 years to have their first body snatching scandal when four students were arrested for grave robbing. Ah, and just to make it very clear right now, grave robbing is different from body snatching in that grave robbers steal the possessions of the quote-unquote mortally challenged, while body snatchers typically just take the body itself. Moving on to the 15th century, Italy allowed for two public dissection demonstrations a year. Think of it as Christmas for anatomists. That happens twice a year and everyone gets to watch you open your present. As you may or may not know, Leonardo da Vinci himself was a dissectionist. He was fascinated by the workings of the human body, but out of fear of retaliation from the government, he was forced to conduct his dissections in fresh tombs at night and hide his journals, which weren't found for 300 years. Leave it to the government to put a halt on progress, but they made up for it in the year 1540 when King Henry of England gave his royal company of barbers and surgeons the exclusive right to dissect four executed felons a year. And Queen Elizabeth I allowed for similar grants in 1564. But the medical disassembly scene in England really started to pop off in 1760. Budding anatomists seeking a license would need to complete two courses of anatomy with dissections included. Now here's the kicker. There were only about 100 legally acquired bodies available a year. Once those were spread through every college in the Queen's nation, some students and professors were forced to go without. In fact, the students of not only England, but most of Europe fought over stiffs like trading cards. Here's a quote from a Scottish professor addressing the death of a local giant, Corny McGrath. Gentlemen, I have been told that some of you in your zeal have contemplated carrying off the body. I earnestly beg you not to think of such a thing, but if you should be so carried away with your desire for knowledge that thus against my expressed wish you persist in doing so, I would have you remember that if you only take the body, there is no law whereby you can be touched, but if you take so much as a rag or stocking with it, it is a hanging matter. Thank you, Bainbot. With high demand and sacred education on the line, there was a great need for men of a certain profession to rise to the occasion. This is where the body snatchers came in. Body snatchers, also known as resurrectionists and sack em up boys, were the people that did the deeds the students, professors, and anyone else that wanted an unalive person didn't want to do for a very lucrative fee. And quite surprisingly, their job wasn't entirely illegal. Yes, back in the heyday of body snatching, laws basically said that a dead person doesn't own their own body. As with the McGrath example a bit ago, if anything else was taken with the body, it was an immediate unalive penalty. Gotta love YouTube. 
The body heisters used this fact to their advantage and generally adhered to that particular law when they set out to complete the grisly operations. Speaking of which, resurrectionists had quite a few tricks up their sleeve and were very selective. Even when it came to jobs with no specific quarry, most would often target the poor or others of the lower classes whom they figured wouldn't be noticed. When those weren't available, they would follow leads of recent deaths and stock cemeteries for fresh graves. Sometimes they would be so bold as to attend the target's own funeral to make sure nothing was wrong or out of place. I'll get back to that in a bit. Once everything was in place, they would head to the grave, oftentimes with a large tarp for the dirt, and start the process. The most frequent method they would use would be to dig down at the head of the coffin and break it open, at which point a rope was tied around the body and it was dragged out. My favorite was when they would dig a manhole 20 feet away and continue digging until they hit the head of the coffin. That was where they would simply crack open the head of the coffin and pull the target out like an ice cream sandwich gets dragged out of the box. They then covered up the hole and left like nothing ever happened. Needless to say, the family and loved ones of the abductees didn't really appreciate the tomfoolery of the body snatchers and began to draw up many countermeasures, including watchtowers and mort saves, which were temporary iron cages with locks that would be placed around buried coffins until their residents had sufficient time to decay. Some even made quite inventive traps, like a child's coffin that was filled with gunpowder and rigged by their father to blow if disturbed hence the reason for the spies at funerals. That's just how reprehensible the resurrectionist's profession was to the general religious population. Despite how dearly the public hated body snatchers, at least murder wasn't on their usual list of to-dos. Unlike a more popular example, William Burke and his friend, also named William. <laughs> William Burke and William Hare started their spree of 16 unalivings over the course of 10 months in 1828, when one of Hare's lodgers passed away and he sought Burke's advice. A lodger is basically a long-term paying guest, usually to help cover rent. Probably more reliable than most roommates, and I just learned that one today. Anywho, Burke being the upstanding bastion of moral impunity that he was, suggested that he and the other Williams sell off the body to Professor Robert Knox, who was a rather photogenic man when you consider that he was disfigured by smallpox. After gaining a hefty seven pounds and ten shillings from that transaction, which would be equivalent to roughly 778 pounds or $1,045.68 when you adjust for inflation, the Williams had gotten a taste of wealth and jumped on the opportunity to get more when another of Hare's lodgers got a terrible fever about two months later. Instead of getting them to a physician, they did the reasonable thing and offed her on the spot for more money. Don't worry, this story has a happy ending, um, of a sort. The Williams were caught after other lodgers discovered their last transaction in progress. Hare was allowed to turn King's evidence, which is a fancy way to say give evidence for immunity and snitch on your accomplice. Burke was found guilty, got a rope necktie, and was dissected by professors and students. And just to add another delicious layer of irony to this, his skeleton is still on display at the Anatomical Museum of Edinburgh Medical School as of the recording of this episode. Be sure to say hi for me and stay away from his Airbnb if you know what's good for you. Now, as I'm sure you may have guessed, this sort of thing wasn't exclusive to Europe. Oh yes, as I mentioned before, this job has global appeal. Let's go over a few examples. Australia. In Tasmania, the bodies of William Land and Truganini, both of whom were considered at the time to be the last Aboriginal Tasmanians, were exhumed from their graves. Land's head, hands, and feet were removed illegally by Surgeon William Crowther in August of 1873, and members of the Royal Society of Tasmania before he was buried, and the rest of his body was stolen after his burial. Truganini, who outlived Land by several years, had wished to avoid his fate and expressly asked to be cremated, but was buried anyway. Two years later, the Royal Society of Tasmania exhumed her skeleton and put it on display. Nearly 100 years after her passing, she was finally cremated and scattered as per her wishes. 
Incredibly tragic, even by my standards, but at least her requests were met at the end. The United States Body snatchers existed in the USA prior to the Revolutionary War as medical institutions began to be founded. John Warren was one of the very first to procure bodies for his studies, and the war gave him just enough info on anatomy to begin his lectures in 1781. The infamous Doctors' Riot occurred after years of tension when a boy playing outside looked inside the window of City Hospital in New York and saw what appeared to be his recently deceased mother being dissected in 1788. The father, of course, led a group of laborers to the hospital to find students, professors, as well as the missing bodies, and then to the jail, where some medical students were hiding for their safety. India. For 200 years, the city of Kolkata has kept a grim reputation as the center of a bone trading network that removes skeletons from graveyards to sell them abroad. The bone factory at the Medical College of Calcutta made an estimated $1 million by digging up graves in West Bengal after the mourners had left as recently as 1980. In fact, bone exportation had gotten so bad that a few people were arrested in public, carrying bags of bones. One such hauler was discovered on a public bus after a fellow passenger noticed what seemed like, quote, an old jagged bone, end quote, sticking out of their backpack. The Indian government banned the export of human bones five years later. But the hustle continued in the shadows, perhaps even to this day. Maybe I should look into it. You never know when you'll need a spare bone or two. And with that, our journey down Morbid Lane is complete. At least for today. If you'd like to know more about this topic, feel free to peruse the sources in the description below. Sadly, I had to leave some info out to keep this video manageable for both you and I. Feel free to subscribe and ring the bell to keep up on things here, because I've got a feeling things are going to pick up pace here very soon. Until next time, dear viewer, and Happy New Year! <laughs>